and his lordship was then the history was repeated and reinforced when I, we were invited to the Central Police Office, Lahore, and His Lordship, Mr. Justice Gulzar Ahmed, also accompanied me, and uh, just to show solidarity with the police, and to also emphasize how, um, how much importance we attach to the police department in running the affairs of the society and looking after the citizens. So now, it's a time for a hat trick. Now, this is the third visit of ours to a police office and uh, not only from that angle but also from the angle that it's not, it's not just one Chief Justice but two Chief Justices have simultaneously visited these offices. One, one suing and the other about to take over and to lead from here on. It's a proud privilege for me to be here and uh, in fact, I'm feeling nostalgic that exactly 30 years ago, in the year 1989, I was a very young lawyer. My elder brother, Mr. Tarek Khosa, was the course commander here in this academy. And uh, Mr. Rathor was the commandant of the, uh, acad uh, this academy. And I was invited here as a young lawyer to speak on police and the fundamental rights enshrined in the Constitution. So I came up with a uh, longish paper and uh, with a printed uh, stuff with me and distributed those, uh, the, the text of my lecture. And uh, this is how my relationship with the police began formally. The informal relationship was already there because my brother joined the police service and ever since police and our family go together. So in the year 1989, um, as I said, Mr. Rathor was the commandant, and he was so gracious and kind today to receive me at the door, and he said, I'll take you with me uh, myself to the audience. And I'm so grateful to you, sir, for honoring me once again, because not only in 1989, but after 30 years, you have greeted me once again and received me. Then... <clears throat> Mr. Tarek Khosa was the course commander at that time, and uh, he then rose to become IG and Director General FIA. He retired. And then uh, the, uh, there was Mr. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Tahir, who was the commandant, who uh, is the commandant today. He was uh, sitting in the audience and uh, listening to my lecture at that time. If I'm uh, not wrong, if, uh, and there are many other officers who were also under training on the, uh, at that time. And they had heard my lecture, I had met them, and uh, uh, as God has willed, we meet again here. And some of them have retired from their service and have risen to the greatest heights possible. So that was the nostalgia that uh, I was reminded of. Uh, Thirty years have passed. I am about to retire, so I'll join the retired uh, community and then reminisce on uh, all these things that have been happening. Today is the 16th of uh, December. Uh, this uh, unfortunate date uh, reminds us of uh, two tragedies that this country has faced. One was the fall of Dhaka on 16th of uh, December and the other was the tragedy at the Army Public School, Peshawar, a few years ago. Both these tragic incidents have some lessons for us. In the fall of Dhaka, the lesson is that a state is created through a social contract between the state and the citizens. If the social contract loosens, if the interaction between the state and the citizen is uh, not strong enough, if the state starts ignoring the rights of the citizens and starts asserting itself too much, then people somehow break away from that social contract. So the Pakistan movement, which in initially started in East Bengal, they were more committed, they were more loyal to Pakistan than we were in the West because they initiated the whole process. 
but they somehow broke away from us because the state did not look after its citizens and the citizens then broke away. So how does the state take care of its citizens? The, the, the mechanism that has been devised is the constitution, the rule of law. And the constitution is that social contract which contains fundamental rights, the rights of the citizens. The, the state must look after its citizens and ensure provision of fundamental rights to its citizens. And this is the only way that you can keep the citizens engaged with whatever the state is doing. Otherwise, the citizens will get disengaged and the state may no, long, may no longer be able to survive as it is. The enforcement of fundamental rights again, that was the topic when I spoke here in 1989. And once again today after 30 years, I will re-emphasize that the state can look after its citizens in two ways. Number one, the governance has to be according to the laws laid down in the Constitution. And number two, the state is to ensure that the fundamental rights reach, the fruits of uh, fundamental rights reach the citizens. And police also plays a very important part in this. Unfortunately, for some time, the perception about the police was that it curbs the fundamental rights and freedoms rather than ensuring fundamental rights and freedoms. So maybe time has come that we have to rethink the whole approach of the police, that the police is basically to protect the citizens against the excesses of the state or excesses of other citizens. The police should be perceived as a protector rather than as a persecutor. So this fundamental change I would emphasize after 30 years once again in this academy that you have to teach this to the uh, under training officers that this is your primary job. You are there for the citizen, not for a colonial master who is to uh, impose its decisions on the citizens. So this fundamental change in the thought process is important if uh, the social contract is to be kept alive so that there is no such incident as happened uh, many years ago in Bangladesh, East Pakistan broke away. This is one lesson we must not forget. The lesson that we get from the uh, Arm, Army Public School incident taking place on this very day some years ago is that that was an incident which shook us all and it shook us out of the slumber. It, sh it in fact prompted us to reconsider our approaches. Terrorism was going on for many, many years before that incident, but that was the incident when we realized that enough is enough. And we as a nation then decided that we have to do something about it. And that is why a national action plan was, uh, uh, was conceived, it was uh, laid down, and uh, the whole nation then supported that effort. And uh, God has been very kind that we have largely and substantially tackled this issue. The lesson here is that when we get together on one agenda, the entire nation, then we can work wonders, we can achieve anything. So we have to Look for those areas where we can get all the people together on one agenda and then go for it together as a nation and there's nothing that we cannot achieve. So these were the lessons. The other aspect of this uh, Army uh, public school episode was the uh, National Action Plan. And National Action Plan had uh, many uh, items in it, but one of those items relevant for today was reforming the criminal justice system. Now we have to uh, consider as to what progress has been made despite passage of so many years. On the judicial side we have uh, taken a lot of initiatives, a number of initiatives and uh, God has been again very kind that uh, somehow we have shaken that system out of its slumber and uh, some initiatives have been launched whereby justice delivery system is improving and through the model courts and other initiatives 
things are getting better. I can't say that they are now very good. But at least we have made some effort and it is showing results and, and uh, things are improving uh, in a rather rapid pace. The other part in the criminal justice system was to be played by the police. And uh, for police, the government, at the government level, unfortunately, nothing significant had happened. Nothing, no steps were taken. In fact, uh, there were other issues, administrative issues, in which the government and the police were embroiled in. But we were focused. The Supreme Court of Pakistan had come up with a police reforms committee on its own through the courtesy of the uh, Law and Justice Commission. All the inspectors general of the police in the entire country, uh, serving inspectors general and some reputed and uh, very experienced uh, retired inspectors general and other leaders of the police, they joined that committee and we came up with many, many initiatives. One of the initiatives was that uh, basically our purpose is to serve the people. And how do you serve the people unless you attend to their grievances? And for grievances, we have to have a mechanism within the police so that people are not driven to go to the courts to solve their issues with the police. The courts are another kind of a dispute resolution mechanism, but it's a formal uh, mechanism. People have to spend a lot of money uh, in that system. But we conceived in the uh, um, Police Reforms Committee that there should be some internal accountability mechanism within the Department of the Police. And the first decision that we took was that uh, SP complaints were introduced in every district in the country. And you'll be surprised at the response. Within the last few months that these SP complaints uh, have been put in place, 33% reduction in people going to district judiciary against the police. This was nationwide. Throughout the country, the average is 33% reduction, which is a huge reduction. That means that those institutions that we have put in place within the police department in the shape of SP complaints, they have started delivering. So 33% less uh, litigants, number of litigants going to the courts for redressal of their grievance against the police. That was before the judiciary at the district level. In the high courts, people used to file writ petitions against the police. The number of writ petitions has been reduced by 15% nationwide, which again is a huge achievement, not only that people get their issues solved without extra expense of uh, hiring the services of a council, going to the court, paying court fees, and then adjournments and things like that. You, they just go to one office and no expense involved, and they, if they're satisfied, then they don't have to go to the courts. Number of cases before the uh, courts reduced so that the judges have more time now to attend to the real issues for which the courts were created. So private grievances against other citizens, they can be attended, People, uh, courts have more time to attend to those grievances now. So this is one step which has seen huge success and we are grateful to the Police Reforms Committee, the wholehearted support of the inspectors general and uh, within no time they came up with the office spaces for the SPs and uh, they provided this uh, staff to them, uh, provided them the infrastructure, the computers and everything. The whole thing was set up within no time and with no extra expense, no budgetary uh, allocation specifically for this. We never asked for any money from the uh, federal uh, consolidated fund or whatever, the bu budget was the same. Within the uh, 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 available resources, the whole thing was achieved. That was one big achievement. The other achievement that was uh, conceived and then was actually achieved, that initiative, was uh, about the district assessment, assessment committees at the district level. We thought that there should be some mechanism whereby the police should get the feedback of whatever investigation they undertake. 
police investigates, sends the chalan to the court, the get, man gets acquitted. Somebody somewhere should analyze as to why this man was acquitted, what was the flaw in the investigation, what, what were the um, deficiencies in the evidence so that those deficiencies are not repeated again in the next cases, in the future cases. So once again, the inspectors general were very quick and uh, they established uh, district assessment committees which include retired sessions judges, some practicing lawyers, some investigators, and uh, it's a very good team at every district uh, level that has assembled, and they examine all the cases of acquittals in that district in one month. So they analyze from those judgments as to what were the weaknesses in the prosecution's case which led to the acquittal. And then a feedback of this, these uh, shortcomings is then passed on to the investigators uh, throughout the district so that in future cases they don't commit those mistakes and those lacunae are filled and uh, resulting in better conviction rate. And we have already re started receiving reports that conviction rates are improving in the criminal justice sector. So this is all because of the Police Reforms Committee and its efforts. The biggest thing so far achieved by the Police Reforms Committee is coming up with the report, a very comprehensive report, suggesting what structural changes are to be made and what operational changes are to be made in the working of the police so that the police is uh, made a modern police force it is made a more effective police force according to the needs of the time. And these reports, unfortunately, many reports were uh, produced in the past. Nothing happened. So I hope, earnestly hope, that this report will receive a proper attention by the governments at all, all levels, the provincial governments as well as the federal government. And we'll keep on pushing that issue from the forum of the Police Reforms Committee. So these are different things that we have done so far and we are so happy. It was all achieved within a few months. And uh, if it was any other government department, it would have taken years. But we have done all this within a few months. And we have many other projects and uh, initiatives in the pipeline. And I am absolutely sure that Mr. Justice Gulzar Ahmed will provide the leadership, will take the torch forward and uh, um, after having remained as a serving Chief Justice, I'll also join the ranks of the retired people. And as a retired person, I'll again be available for any service that I can render. <laughs> the vision behind all this was that as far as the police force is concerned, it has to be depoliticized. I gave one uh, solution at Lahore and so far it hasn't been acted upon. And it can be depoliticized. You see, we, whatever changes that we have been successfully, uh, we have been uh, able to successfully bring in in the judiciary is through doing very small things. Don't look for very higher, bigger things. Do very small things which make big difference. At, at Lahore I said, if you want to be depoliticized, I'll give you a very small uh, solution to this. And the solution is that you decide for yourself that I'll not accept political dictation in my working. Whatever the government of the day gives, gives me direction, I am bound to carry out that direction. But as far as the individual political influences are concerned, I will not tolerate them. How do you do that? It's very simple. Whenever you receive a safarish from any uh, Nazim, or, um, or an MPA, or an, or an MNA, or a senator, or a minister, or anybody. Just write it down. Start proceedings against that official for whom that Safarish came. It is misconduct. It is included in the definition of misconduct in the Civil Servant Act. If somebody brings about influence in the matter of posting, transfer, or promotion, it is misconduct. So start the proceeding against that person and simultaneously send that message or letter of recommendation or safarish 
to the National Accountability Bureau because it is misuse of authority. A simple, only five or six people will have to pay the price, they'll be transferred here and there, but then if everybody starts doing it, it will become the national culture, it will change the national culture. Nobody will dare send you such as a parish. If somebody calls you up on telephone, these days telephone record, telephone data is available. It's so easily available. Your number, other number, call the call data and then attach it with your complaint, send it to the National Accountability Bureau. Just two or three cases and things you'll see how dramatically things will change. We people are very adjustable. We adjust to the new situation very quickly and uh, there will be no safarish to you anymore. You just have to decide for yourself, do you want to do it or not? Or you want to just keep on paying lip service that we want the police to be depoliticized. Nobody will depoliticize you as long as those who politicize are the beneficiaries of this politicization. You will have to make it difficult for them to politicize you. So it is up to you. You will have to t take this decision, and the day you take this, this decision, you will then remember me, that a very small totka was given to us. It has worked wonders. It will work wonders. The other vision, part of the vision that we have is uh, the police should be highly accountable, yes, obviously, and operationally and administratively autonomous. For that, we have already given a few judgments, and if you can push them through, your operational autonomy can be ensured. But if you just keep on accepting what happens to you, then nothing will change. You will have to fight for your independence. You will have to uh, go to courts for this uh, particular aspect. You will have to assert your legal domain and legal rights. And as long as you don't assert, nothing will happen to you, and you'll keep on suffering. So it's only when somebody stands up for his right that right is then ensured or given to him. So again, you have to make up your own minds here. Okay, do you want to be operationally independent or not? If you do, then obviously the courts are there, and uh, if the law supports you, then the court will support you. The law will have the last word. So again, you have to make up your mind. The vision is there, and we have been talking about it for decades and decades, that you want to be operationally independent, administratively independent. You will not become operationally or administratively independent unless you start asserting it. Don't wait for uh, an NGO to go to a court. Go and fight for your rights. You will not be fighting for yourself. You will be fighting for your force and the institution. And the court will then look at the legal position and then declare it so. The other part of the vision is that it has to be highly professional. Here the, the academy comes in. It is the academy which uh, has to prepare uh, the highly professional force that we require for this society. You see, unfortunately, in all the criminal cases, what we see is that no investigative skills are taught to the police officers. After all, you're dealing with a crime, with, all, with crimes all the time. A crime coming to your notice is not the end of the story. A, arresting an accused person is not the end of the whole thing. It is not nabbing a criminal, but it is to make sure that he is brought to justice. That is the end result, and he will be brought to justice only if the investigating officer is trained in proper investigation, an investigation which can, which can withstand the scrutiny, scrutiny in a court of law. So you have to focus on that. crowd ko disperse kaise karna hai, wo bhi ek training hai, aur kitne maamlaat hai, patrolling kaise karni hai, streets ki, wo bhi training hai. But basically, all this patrolling and crowd and everything is relevant to a crime being committed. So criminal investigation ki training par aap focus kijiye zaroor aur taftishi afsar ko pata hona chahiye ki court mein kaun si cheez acceptable hai, kaun si nahi hai. Uske bagheer, without that you can't prove a case in a court of law. It has to be proved according to the law, not to the satisfaction, moral satisfaction of the judge that he must have done it so I have to convict him. No, no judge will do that. 
So unless your investigating officers are well trained in the legal provisions, they will not deliver. They will only arrest a person, be convinced, he will be convinced that he is the one who has done it, but his conviction is not enough. Somebody else's satisfaction is required. For that, training comes in, and I would uh, insist that uh, you must revise all those that uh, uh, training is being given to the investigating officers so that the criminal justice system starts delivering when a criminal is actually convicted. The other part of the vision was that uh, you have to be a community service and uh, you have to earn the trust of the people. And I'm sure uh, a lot of emphasis is being given now after the police reforms committee and our deliberations. We have been hammering this in that uh, this is the main task. From the mindset of a colonial police force, you have to transform into a police force which is meant to serve the public. So this mindset has to change. This approach has to change. And I'm sure uh, the present leadership of the police is well aware of this. And a number of steps have already been taken in that regard. And more and more steps will be taken so that, like we, when we go to England on the streets, we see a Bobby. We look at him as a friend and a guide rather than a persecutor. Here, things were different in the past. They are improving, but still not to the desired extent. I can remember that there was a servant of ours in Dera Ghazi Khan whose father used to live in a village. And that father used to tell us that whenever he saw a police officer coming or a police official coming to his village, he would jump into the canal to save himself. He said, I don't know who is coming, but I should disappear. So ye jo usko ek friend ke taur pe apne aap ko ka perception agar aap develop karenge ki ek helper khada hai yahan pe vardi mein yahan pe aap ko help karne ke liye khada ye image jab aap banayenge to tab ja ke ye sare visions pure honge and i'm sure whatever within the limited period we have done and uh, we have done a lot uh, we thankful to god almighty but a lot more is yet to be done and under the able leadership of Justice Gulzar Ahmed and the able leadership of the present police uh, uh, leaders in their own provinces and in their own jurisdictions, all this can be achieved. The vision is there. Leadership is there. Inshallah, you will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before I sit down, again, some history has been made. No Chief Justice has been given a reference by the police. So this here... Uh, no Chief Justice ever in, I think, in any part of the world has been given a reference, a send-off reference, a farewell by the police. So this again augurs very well that these two components of the justice sector must cooperate with each other and have respect for each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.